Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fresa. This week, three guests dig into some festering political controversies. Wrapping up our program will be Victor Bernson from Americans for Prosperity, fresh off a court victory over California's activist attorney general seeking to intimidate political opponents. Along the way, we'll chat with former FDA Deputy Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, who unpacks the EpiPen fiasco. Up first, I'm pleased to welcome Naomi Schaefer Riley, columnist for the New York Post and author of The New Trail of Tears, How Washington is Destroying American Indians. Naomi, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Bill. Naomi, I've been following your column for some time, yet it feels like this new book of yours came down out of the blue. Whatever possessed you to bear witness to the horrors of life on American Indian reservations? Well, I think like many Americans, I probably followed the tragic stories coming off of Indian reservations just out of kind of a morbid curiosity. I had been reading stories for decades now about the suicide epidemics and alcoholism rates, and we can get into the statistics Mm -hmm. about those later. But I had asked people over the years, especially when I was an editor at the Wall Street Journal, if they could, you know, enlighten me and explain to me what was going on uh, on these reservations and why things were so terrible. And I typically got two responses when I asked people to write about this. Uh, either they would say, I don't know the first thing about it, uh, which was the most common response, or I wouldn't touch that topic with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> So, you know, as any good journalist, of course, that just made me more interested. And a few years ago, I went to a conference up in Montana where it it was about property rights and American Indians. I thought, property rights and American Indians, there's kind of an obscure topic, and I wonder, you know, what it's really about. And there was a group of 25 scholars gathered in the room there who knew exactly why the things that were happening on reservations were happening on reservations. And I thought, is this a big secret, or uh, can I tell this story? Well, I'd like to read a quote of yours that really struck me. If you want to know why American Indians have the highest rates of poverty of any racial group, why suicide is a leading cause of death among Indian men, why Native women are two and a half times more likely to be raped than the national average, and why gang violence affects American Indian youth more than any other group, do not look to history. I mean, Naomi, this runs totally contrary to the Native American exploitation narrative every American school kid is taught How can a Harvard graduate like yourself promote such heresy? (laughs) Well, I don't want to, you know, discount the horrible history of war and forced assimilation that American Indians have experienced. But I think what most kids learn in school is really just a small part of the story. I was really interested. I, I read a story when I was first researching the book about a college professor who was teaching history, and she asked her students, what they knew about American Indians. And about half the class said they thought all American Indians were dead. (laughs) I just thought that was so striking because I think it really does illustrate just how little we know about American Indians today. So essentially, I would say that it's the policies in Washington today that have created the deplorable conditions on Indian reservations. The first thing that people don't understand is what a reservation is. Well, give us a snapshot of life on the reservation today. The statistics you quote in your book are really chilling. Absolutely. So first of all, American Indians are the most impoverished racial or ethnic group in the country. They are the most likely to be involved in gang activity. They have the highest rates of alcohol use disorders. American Indian women are about two and a half times as likely to be sexually assaulted as the average American women, and American Indian children are twice as likely to be abused. Suicide is the leading cause of death among American Indian boys aged 10 to 14. Wow. How many people still live on Indian reservations? There are over a million people living on Indian reservations today. And how many government bureaucrats work at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education? And what are the budgets of these agencies? Well, we send billions upon billions of dollars to Indian reservations. There are about 9,000 employees at the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which also includes the Bureau of Indian Education. And so that's, if you do the math, about one bureaucrat for every 110 people living on the reservation. So I think they see it as like being in charge of kind of a small elementary school. 
the level of micromanagement of the lives of people on reservations is pretty shocking. I spoke to one man, uh, a tribal leader in the Crow tribe, and he said, we are the most overregulated race on earth. So paint us a picture. Take us to Montana. What does a reservation look like? So I think what a lot of people don't understand, first of all, is what a reservation is. Of course, reservations started as a way of us moving American Indians out of the way so Americans could pursue westward expansion, manifest destiny, all that stuff you mm. learn in elementary school. But why do we still have reservations today? Reservations are a way that the federal government holds land in trust for American Indians, which means they don't actually own the land. If one Indian wanted to buy or sell a piece of land to another one on a reservation, they would first have to get the permission of someone thousands of miles away in Washington. Second of all, they could never go into a bank and get a mortgage because they don't have the underlying title to the land. A a banker would say, how can Mm -hmm. I give you a mortgage? You have no equity. You have no ability to go into a bank like many Americans do if you want to start a small business and say, I want to take out a home equity loan. That access to capital is simply unavailable to American Indians, and that's why these reservations are such bleak places. There is no private sector. It sounds a lot like a dysfunctional banana republic. It absolutely is. American Indian reservations, I think some of them are like third world countries in the middle of the wealthiest nation on earth. Naomi, your book states that the U.S. government spends about $20,000 per pupil for students in Indian schools. I mean, you could buy an elite prep school education for that. That's absolutely true. And of course, this is true in other areas of the country. We spend an enormous amount of money on some of the worst public schools in the country. But the state of Indian education is absolutely deplorable. I visited a school on the Pine Ridge Reservation where I saw a principal who was giving incorrect answers to a second grader on arithmetic problems. (laughs) And she, by the way, had recently fired at least five Teach for America staff members from her school because she felt they weren't the right fit for her school. Now, these are kids who are coming, as you probably know, from Mm -hmm. some of the best colleges in the country, and she can't even do basic arithmetic. To me, that wasn't even the most horrifying part of the story. As I stood there with her watching some kids who are playing in a kindergarten classroom, she said to me, once a month, Of course, you know, we have lock-in weekend. And I said, really, what's lock-in weekend? That sounds terrible. What did these Mm. poor kids do? And she said, oh, no, that's the weekend that we have the kids stay here because the government checks go out. And we know that's the weekend that the parents are most likely to drink and abuse their children. Oh, boy. Well, let's talk a little bit about business on the Indian reservations. Why are casinos one of the only businesses they seem to run? Casinos are what I call part of the loophole economy that we have given to American Indians. So we haven't given them access to the private sector. They don't have property rights. They don't have a free market. It's very hard to open a business. And so what the U.S. government has done is said, well, these are certain sectors where we'll give tribes either a tax or regulatory advantage. So, for instance, many people are aware that you used to be able to buy cigarettes Mm. tax-free on reservations, and that was a huge source of income for many tribes. But then it became casinos, and the federal government said, even if the state has outlawed gambling, we will allow Indians to engage in this enterprise and consider them sort of separate or outside of state law. So many uh, Indian tribes decided to go into this business. A few of them were hugely successful, places like Foxwoods, of course. I visited the Seneca Territory in upstate New York. And the Senecas have actually made over a billion dollars off of their casino industry because they had this advantage. Now, of course, that advantage is drying up because more and more states have realized that there's a lot of money to be made in gambling, and they've opened it up to non-Indians. So how are casino profits distributed to tribe members, and and what's the connection between the work they perform and, and the money each member receives? Well, this is, I think, what's so sad. A lot of people do assume that because the tribes have made so much money that their people must be so much better off. Unfortunately, they're not. So if you live in the Seneca Territory, when you turn 21, somebody sends you a check in the mail for $30,000 simply for being a member of that tribe. Now, up until that point, you've had, as I mentioned, a deplorable education. You probably haven't worked and you haven't invested, you haven't Mm. saved, and somebody sends you a check for $30,000. It's as if you won the lottery. And even tribal leaders will acknowledge that they simply blow the money, maybe on a truck, but also likely on drugs or alcohol. Indian tribes themselves spend millions lobbying the government. What are they after if it's not the freedom to live like other Americans? 
Unfortunately, I think what's happened with American Indians is a lot of what's happened with other minority groups in this country. What you get is kind of the civil rights establishment. You get people who are really in this business to shake down the government, and they say to their people, what's really holding you down is the fact that you don't get enough money from Washington, and if only we got more money from Washington, then your problems would be solved. But when I visited these reservations, particularly in Montana and South Dakota, I would talk to older people on the reservations, and a lot of them are very much disenchanted, I think, with this establishment because they have seen for decades these promises that if only we get more money, our conditions will improve. And unfortunately, they haven't. The only thing that will improve this situation is bringing economic freedom and property rights to these reservations. Naomi, let's move on to some of the cultural issues. My ancestors experienced many of the same horrors that American Indians experienced in the 19th and 20th century which is, of course, why they fled to America. I know the stories, but I bear none of those scars. What makes American Indians so different from the rest of us hyphenated Americans? Well, it's kind of interesting to compare the immigrant mentality with American Indians. What's happened on a lot of these reservations, again, largely, I think, due to the economic deprivation and the lack of opportunity that American Indians have is that they really are not encouraging their children to leave the reservations and to go off and pursue better educations or better opportunities the way other immigrant communities do. It was interesting, right before this book, I had worked on a project about Catholic schools and the opportunities they were Mm -hmm. providing to young kids in inner city in New York and other poor areas in the country. And, of course, parents are banging down the doors of these schools trying to pull together enough money to make sure that their kids can get this better education. Then I went to visit Indian reservations, and I found that the Catholic schools on those reservations, even though they were so much superior to the local public schools, had lots and lots of empty seats, and they were actually free tuition. So what was going on? I think part of it is that These parents really don't understand what the other alternative sources of education are for their children, what the opportunities are. It's a little bit of the difference, I think, between rural poverty and urban poverty. If you live in the South Bronx and you get on the subway every day, Mm. chances are you will see a middle-class American on his way to work in a suit. There are kids on these reservations who don't have a single member of their family who's employed, who don't know anyone who's graduated from high school, If if they watch TV and see pictures of what goes on in the rest of America, they will assume it is another planet. This Native American cultural glue is something that's so hard to understand. Government policies don't do anything to maintain the ethnic identity of Irish, Italians, Jews, Poles, or any of us who eagerly dove into the melting pot. Why is Washington so obsessed with maintaining the ethnic identity of the Indians, especially when the culture is so dysfunctional? I think you have to separate some of this. Some of the culture is dysfunctional because Washington has created this culture of dependency on these reservations. But there's nothing dysfunctional necessarily about traditional Indian culture, just as there's nothing dysfunctional about the traditionally religious and cultural societies that have come to be part of the melting pot. You have to separate those things a little bit. Unfortunately, the government thinks now that the answer to Indians' problems is not only more money, but more cultural sensitivity. Mm. And the way that works itself out is first in, of course, silly debates about the names of football teams, because that's where a national conversation really needs to be uh, when we're talking about a community where suicide is the leading cause of death for 10 to 14-year-olds. But second of all, the cultural sensitivity actually works itself out in these policies. I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with the Indian Child Welfare Act, for instance which is a law that essentially requires children who are in custody cases for divorce or adoption cases for a tribe to actually have a say in where that child is placed, oh boy. even if that placement is not necessarily in the best interest of the child. In the case of Indian policies, what is so unique is that we are actually giving the kind of power to the tribe as opposed to saying, this is America, these are American citizens, and we need to do our best to protect their individual rights. That's the role of the American government here. Well, the government seems to be spending a lot of time trying to bully the Washington Redskins into changing their name. How is this alleged to actually hurt Native Americans? And is there any evidence that that's true? There's really not much evidence that it's true at all. The allegation is that the names of and mascots of teams – 
that involve American Indians is somehow causing psychological trauma to American Indian communities. And again, I say this is hugely insulting to American Indians. When your community is facing the kinds of problems that these communities are facing, the statistics that we were talking about earlier, the notion that anyone cares and that it, even when I went to these reservations, I would ask people about this, and you would really have a hard time getting people to talk about these issues because it's so low down on their list of priorities for their community. After emancipation, there was a policy that went by the motto of something like 40 acres and a mule. How might something like this apply if Indian reservations were just broken up once and for all and the property and even the mineral rights were just distributed to the members? It's very hard to imagine how you would do that. One name for this book that I considered, by the way, was called Cancel the Reservations, <laughs> because I do think that therein lies a lot of the problem here. I think we need to think about a solution like Canada is actually considering right now. They have a similar population. They call their Indians First Nations there, and they live on reserves as opposed to reservations. But other than that, they have a very similar situation. And they're considering something called the First Nations Property Ownership Act in Parliament, which would actually give Native Americans the underlying title to the land. That is, as a government entity, this would still be under the political guidance of the Native American community, but it would allow individual Native Americans to own the land outright. So just as if you lived in the city of Boston and sold land to somebody else, it would still be part of the city of Boston, but you would be able to go to a bank and get a mortgage and you'd be able to buy and sell property without the permission of Washington. So American Indians would then get the rights that the rest of Americans have. Naomi, you write that the tragedy caused by the government's Indian policy is a microcosm of everything that has gone wrong with modern liberalism. How so? I think that the approach the left has taken for the better part of the last half century, if not longer, is that if we want to solve the problems of poverty and dysfunction in our poorer communities, the answer is giving people more money. And the answer is offering them more cultural sensitivity. And I think that while we see very good evidence in communities all across the country that this has not worked, Indian reservations are actually the best possible example of this. I mean, if you think about the Seneca tribe, what I was saying earlier about how they earned a billion dollars off their Mm. casino, this is what Washington would like to do. They would like to take, let's just put this sort of bluntly, If they could drop a billion dollars from a plane into the South Bronx and then they could make sure that everyone promised, you know, not to say anything racist or insult the people in the South Bronx, then essentially the assumption is that the people in the South Bronx would be doing great. All we need to do is just hand them that amount of money and they will make the right decisions with it. If you go to these areas, you will see that's simply not the case. What's amazing about the Senecas is that their standard of living has really barely budged since they made this amount of money. Their schools are still as bad as they were before. They've paid for a few extra security officers to join the local public school. That's what they've done with this money. Their health services are slightly improved, but all their storefronts are shuttered. Most people still have no incentive to get a job because they get this small annuity in the mail every month. And the poverty there is horrendous. We can't be thinking about these policies of more money and more cultural sensitivity as the answer to helping disadvantaged communities anymore. Naomi, give us some hope. What can we do as a nation to fix this? Well, I mentioned the property rights, but I also want to end on a note of something that I have written about in other communities as well. I think education reform has tremendous potential in Indian communities. Unfortunately, some of the states that have the largest Indian populations also have no charter school laws. I would love to see a state like South Dakota enact a charter law and have a group like the KIPP Academy or Success Academies or other high-performing charter schools come in and be able to offer the real opportunities of a great education to these communities because fundamentally, they are going to have to be leading the revolution that needs to take place next. The best story that I heard on one of these reservations was a group of parents from the Pine Ridge Reservation, which is in the second poorest county in the United States, were taken on a plane trip to Denver where they got to see high-performing charter schools. 
And they came back, and I spoke to them, and they were utterly shocked to find out that kids in Denver, many of whom live in homes where English is not even a first language, were receiving this amazing education. And they began thinking to themselves, how can we get that for our kids? Naomi, your book was a real eye-opener. Thanks for joining us to share the story. Thank you so much. That was New York Post columnist Naomi Schaefer-Riley, author of The New Trail of Tears, How Washington is Destroying American Indians, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. To make sure you don't miss any of our shows, please stop by realclearradio.org and sign up for updates. Today's program was partially underwritten by the generous support of Donors Trust, the donor-advised fund committed to promoting a free society. For more information, visit DonorsTrust.org. Ahead, we'll speak with former FDA Deputy Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb from the American Enterprise Institute. Stay tuned.